On today's episode, I'm discussing all things tendinopathy with Dr. Peter Maliaris. Welcome to the podcast, helping you overcome your proximal hamstring tendinopathy. This podcast is designed to help you understand this condition, learn the most effective evidence-based treatments, and of course, bust the widespread misconceptions. My name is Brody Sharp. I'm an online physiotherapist, recreational athlete, creator of the Run Smarter series, and a chronic proximal hamstring tendinopathy battler. Whether you are an athlete or not, this podcast will educate and empower you in taking the right steps to overcome this horrible condition. So let's give you the right knowledge along with practical takeaways in today's lesson. Okay, let me get up my notes. Uh, Today is an interesting conversation that we are having. Um, It was back on my podcast the Run Smarter podcast where I interviewed Dr. Peter Maliaris and it's a fascinating topic around scans, strength, PRP, injection and shockwave um, and answering a few Facebook questions, essentially what the title (laughs) of the podcast said. Um, So what I'll do is I'll play you that interview. It's going to be highly relevant for proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Most of the, the topic will be extremely relevant Uh, because we do know that the tendinopathies of the lower limb, the pathology of the tendons in the lower limb, have very, very similar responses to exercise and PRP and shockwave and rehab. So um, we do cover tendinopathy as a general sense, but you should take a lot away. I do ask a few questions around, or there were some Facebook questions that were asked around like... um, tendons around the ankle, but I decided to leave them in there just in case you wanted some um, additional information. Uh, But nonetheless, you'll take a lot away. I'll play you the snippet of the interview now, and I'll chime back in after the interview to discuss um, my key takeaways when it comes to proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Okay, let's take it away. So Dr. Peter Maliaris has been a respected and leading tendinopathy researcher and clinician for the past 15 years. In 2006, he completed his PhD in tendinopathy, identifying novel risk factors, and since has undertaken his postdoc research in UK and Australia, he has co-authored over 55 peer-reviewed publications, which have all been related to tendinopathy. Currently, he has research affiliations with La Trobe Uni and University of Melbourne in Australia, and Queen Mary University in London and is involved in numerous tendinopathy clinical research studies and maintains a strong clinical focus specializing in different tendinopathy cases for over 10 years. He sees around 30 to 40 tendinopathy patients per week and regularly consults with elite athletes. He has his um, website, which is tendinopathyrehab.com, which is where I've got that info from. And he wants me to share that out with you guys if you have any other information after this uh, interview. If you finish listening to this and want to find out more, that's where you can go. We covered a lot in this podcast. We covered Peter's research, what he has done in the past and what he's doing now. What is essentially what's the most effective management for tendinopathies? Where are we at with the research? Where are we at with shockwave, PRP, other injectables? Where's the relevance in terms of Uh, receiving scans, what other structures might be at play. And then I haven't really done this yet on the podcast, but I got some Facebook group members to submit some questions and we went through those questions today at the end. I hope you enjoy this. It was a big one for me. Um, I was really, really excited to talk to him and the outcome was more than I'd hoped for. So let's bring on Peter. Thanks for coming on, by the way. Let's start with um how you ended up in the field of tendons let's start with that sure uh so um i worked as a uh i worked as a physio for uh probably five years um since uh when i finished and um i always i've always been someone who questions everything um like a skeptic type person and um, I ended up uh, just thinking, what am I doing when I first graduated for a few years in terms of am I actually helping people? Do I know what I'm doing? 
um, to the point where it sort of led me towards reading literature and then just thinking about doing a PhD and that's when I decided to do it. And um, basically uh, then it was just serendipity more than anything, just um, the right, right place at the right time. Um, and um, I was interested in attendance, but I guess the PhD really, um, you know, uh, brought that uh, to the next level. Cool. And is there, what sort of past and current research have you focused on? The past research was really about um, understanding pathology. So the imaging and the imaging, how the imaging changes over time. Um, so one of my studies contributed to the continual model the thinking about how the pathology changes. Um, and um, that was one that I did with Jill Cook as part of my PhD. Um, so that was sort of heavily influenced by Jill and sort of some of her thinking, which was along the lines of pathology and pain and, you know, some really good studies there. But my sort of interests um, have gone away from that a bit more towards I'm interested in um, very much interested in, in exercise now. So probably the best way to describe the research I do now is a lot of it is trials looking at exercise and education and how we can optimise those interventions. Um, and then the other part of what I do is um, from a research point of view is looking at, I've got a biomechanics sort of lab at Clayton uh, campus in Monash where we look at biomechanical research. So look at impairments. So, you know, are there sort of um, impairments with, uh, you know, rate of force development and strength and balance and how can we then again optimize our interventions to address those? Okay. So it you're using that to maybe perhaps identify deficits in strength or power and then seeing if there's any correlation or whether treatment and management should be focused around those deficits? Yep, exactly. So uh, we really don't have a lot uh, at the moment of knowledge about what, you know, if you're looking at an Achilles patient, for example, um, how they present, what we should be uh, focusing on um, in terms of managing these people, what deficits remain. So if you look at the exercise literature, people just do quite generic things without much thought to them. And, um, you know, people still tend to get better. But um, if we did more specific things that were targeted towards impairments, maybe we would have better outcomes. Okay. And that's what the literature is aiming for is to have a bit more of a targeted exercise prescription and therefore theoretically recover a lot quicker and more effectively. That's, that's, yeah, that, that's part of it. Uh, the problem with that sort of thinking is um, we don't, I, I guess it sort of opens the whole area of the mechanisms of exercise. So how does exercise work? Is it, is it that we're targeting strength and people just, if they're weak, make them strong and their pain goes away? It's not that simple. If, they, if they've got, you know, impaired power, we, we, we improve their power and they, their pain goes away. I, I think there's a, a slight disconnect between what happens from a functional point of view, people getting more power and strength, and what happens from a pain point of view because pain is so multifactorial. So the mechanisms there could be, um, you know, uh, changing their uh, thought processes and their beliefs rather than or in combination with some of the other uh, neuromuscular factors. So I think in trying to get someone more functional, we have to think about power and strength. In trying to improve their pain, uh, that's that's a different uh, consideration. Obviously, power and strength may be important, but a lot of other factors are important as well. Okay, and you did mention there's some focus on education when it comes to the pain management. Yeah, ab absolutely. So uh, I, I've just sort of come to the realization, probably in the last five years, that our education is just non-existent when it comes to development of education. Um, interventions. So one, one thing that I've spent a fair bit of time on in the last, uh, in that time is trying to develop education that is uh, going to address the needs of people with tendinopathy. So we've developed an education intervention for people with rotator cuff related pain and we're testing that in, in a trial at the moment. Um, and the way we did that was we uh, looked at the literature 
and clinical practice guidelines and we looked at all the types of education they recommend and then we looked at um, uh, interviewing a whole bunch of uh, shoulder experts and said what education do you think we should include uh, in pe for people with rotator cuff related pain and then we interviewed a whole bunch of patients and we also asked them uh, you know with that condition asked them what they uh, what their education needs are so that that's brought us now to a point of developing this education, which has taken probably a couple of years. Uh, but I think we need more of that. We need more because uh, if you're, you know, a clinician and you're, you're seeing a patient like this, what do you educate them about? Obviously, people are all individual, and you know, you're going to target different things with different people. But uh, you do need some sort of framework to uh, to base your education on. This podcast is sponsored by the Run Smarter series. If you want to take your knowledge building to the next level, I have built out a proximal hamstring tendinopathy video course, which complements the podcast perfectly. Sometimes it's tough delivering concepts and exercises through an audio format. So the course brings a visual component full of rehab exercise examples, graphs, and visual displays to enhance your understanding. Even if you sign up now, you'll have access to all current and future modules that I create. Sign up through my link in the show notes then download the Run Smarter app and you'll instantly have unlimited access to all the course resources on any device. And to say thanks for being a podcast listener, I want to give you a VIP offer. There will be a link in the show notes in every episode that will provide you 50% off the course price. Just click on the link and it will automatically apply your 50% discount. You've sort of described the gap between delivering the correct education and how um it's kind of emerging have you what else have we seen in the last five to ten years or so that's been a radical change in the way that we manage tendons i would say probably nothing that is that you could describe as radical um, and very different um i think probably isometrics might might be one that qualifies but um, what happened was we had this isometric um, uh, study that came out in 2013 that showed that isometrics are um, uh, helpful for reducing pain in the short term. And it also in parallel to that was a reduction or a reversal in inhibition in the brain, in the motor cortex. Um, and that uh, sparked a lot of interest in isometrics. People started using it a lot. And um, now, that, you know, science is self-correcting and we're, sh we're seeing now that maybe we're a bit too um, enthusiastic and, and maybe there isn't that much difference in the isometric, in the effect in short-term pain isometrics versus other exercise. Um, it seems to be that you'll get similar responses if you just load people progressively. So um, that, what, that has been a really influential thing that people have taken on board. Uh, a lot and um, uh, I guess it's uh, one of those things that happens you, people uh, often run with things and we just don't have the evidence to back it up but aside from that we're just doing the same stuff and hopefully getting better at it uh, but you know the the, the 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 key to management of attendinopathy is a good progressive exercise to, to bring about tolerance of the tendon as well as good education to couple with that and not um, overdoing it with things that can aggravate, like um, you know loads that uh, are high for the tendon, and that's th those basics really haven't changed. And if you scratch the surface below those things, and aside from those things, to all the adjuncts like shockwave and injections and surgery and um, you know everything else, the evidence is really really poor, and um, we really don't uh, have good evidence or. Any, anything that is, um, you know, we can strongly recommend aside from exercise and even the exercise evidence isn't that good. Hence why we're trying to improve it. Um, so, I, I, you know, things that, things are improving. It probably sounds very, you know, pessimistic, but things are improving, but I would say very slowly. Okay. Um, and just to recap a little bit, just for those who are unaware, so the isometrics being an exercise where you hold on to the weight with, out movement so the tendon is under load without going through any range of movement and so what was well what was discovered was if you were to 
hold on to those heavy loads without movement. And then after you do a certain desired amount of holds around 30, 45 seconds, the pain might diminish. <clears throat> and so we got excited about that and focused on the isometrics for a long period of time. But then as more evidence started emerging, realizing that uh, loading up the tendon through movement could be having a similar effect. Am I right in saying mm -hmm. that? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, great. And so what can we say currently around things like shockwave and PRP and other injectables? Cause I know these um, treatments do get thrown around a lot and people are a bit unsure of uh, if they're eligible or if it will be most effective for them. So based on the uh, research that's out there at the moment, what can we conclude? Yeah, look, um, uh, it's a real tricky area. Uh, if you look at um, shockwave therapy, it, it, uh, for any treatment, we need to know whether it works over and above placebo. And um, for shockwave, <clears throat> there's studies out there uh, that have compared it, to, compared it to placebo. And in some studies, it shows that it's no different to placebo. Um, in others, it shows that it has more of an effect on outcomes like pain and function. So it's a bit uncertain if it works. And it's probably similar um, for PRP, uh, the blood injections um, that people people offer. It they don't necessarily uh, well. A lot of the, the a lot of the high quality studies show that there's no difference of placebo. So it's important to when you're reading literature as a clinician or a patient, um, think about the comparison. Because if you compared, as some studies have, PRP to steroid, um, in the long term, a lot of those studies have shown that PRP is better. But that's probably because steroid is harmful in the long term. So you need to be very careful of the comparison. And placebo comparisons for things like this are really important, I believe. We need to know whether they um, work over and above doing um, uh, something like a placebo, which controls obviously for the placebo effect. Um, and, um, you know, we just don't have that evidence for anything um, convincingly in tendinopathy. Aside from, it could be argued exercise is the only thing that we can say, okay, there is, you know, this probably does do something. Uh, but, you know, even that is, um, and not uh, not the strongest evidence. So we have a you know a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it'd be very tricky to design such studies where there is a control group or a blinded group that thinks they're getting the treatment, but in reality is not. So that you can have a, a good comparison of what a placebo is. But it also, if you are having a blinded control group, it's even um, knowing like how powerful the brain can be with placebo um, can be quite tricky. If you have say someone who uh, a group that undergoes shockwave, but then another group that doesn't, but thinks they are getting the correct intervention, um, the power that the brain can have to actually reduce pain or um, help with management. Exactly. And so it's, exactly. yeah, it's got to be extremely cool. tough. Yeah, yeah, that's why placebo is so important. So if you look at um, why people get better over time, there's lots of different reasons. One could be the treatment itself. One could be just natural history and time. Um, and that's, a, that's also, you know, a, a powerful effect. Uh, one could be, um, as you say, the power of the mind, which is placebo, which is a physiological effect. We, we know that if we think we're receiving something that's going to help us, we do get benefit from that. So that's a physiological effect. And, and that's what you're controlling with placebo comparison. But if you've just got a control group, which could be a wait list group, so they're just waiting it out, or it could be um, no treatment control, or it could be um, you know, minimal intervention, active control, where you just give them a pamphlet and say, see you in 12 weeks. Uh, they, they, they control for uh, natural history, so people just getting better naturally over time, but not for placebo, because they know they're not getting the right treatment. Or the, or the active treatment um, or the better treatment. So yeah, so placebo is important if you want to know if something works over and above, uh, over and above just, as you say, the sort of power of the mind. Okay. And you did mention before that um, 
you delved into um, scans and how relevant they can be. Is Do you recommend any type of scan over another at the moment for someone who does have a chronic tendinopathy? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. It's, um, I, we, I was part of a consensus group uh, that met at the last international uh, tendinopathy scientific conference in um, uh, it was last end of last year, and uh, what we one of the things we talked about was the diagnosis of tendinopathy and how can we what what should we be recommending for people who are clinicians and also people who are doing research for how we should diagnose this problem and what we pretty much unanimously decided or agreed on was that uh, you don't need uh, you don't need a scan to make a, a diagnosis of tendinopathy because it is a clinical problem. So you diagnose it based on how it behaves, the pain behaviour, where the pain is, what aggravates the pain, and some of the other clinical tests that we can do. So you don't need a scan. Um, so you definitely don't need a scan. We can diagnose confidently without a scan. Um, where a scan probably does uh, fit in is when you have failed um, the, the first line treatments that we offer, like the education, the exercise we talked about earlier, then you can start to think about a scan and, um, uh, you know, that, that might be then leading to some other intervention. It could be an injection or it could be, you know, it's, it's important to rule things, you know, out if you're not getting better, there might be something else that has been missed or, uh, you know, not to be alarmist and to get people to worry, but um, often the diagnosis is very, very uh, you know, we're confident of the diagnosis without a scan, but um, uh, getting a scan if you're not responding is a reasonable thing to do, and that's sort of where it fits in. But what people have to remember is that, uh, and this is the difficult thing, what is on the scan, um, the scan will show lots of things. Most of them are normal, age-related, uh, age-related uh, changes, um, you, you can have some, you know, what they would call degeneration in your tendon or some thickening in the tendon. Uh, and that's just a normal age-related process. It doesn't mean you're going to have pain. It doesn't mean you have pain. It doesn't mean your pain is coming from that. And that's the hard bit for people to get around their head. The clinical diagnosis is absolutely key. Obviously, if the pain is consistent with a tendon problem and you've got the degeneration or whatever else, then it sort of increases our confidence that, you know, this is a tendon problem. But the diagnosis, as I say, is clinical. Um, and that's what we really uh, look at. Um, I guess where imaging is important is, um, you know, what we call differential diagnosis. So what else uh, could be, uh, could be uh, you know, there that we uh, may be able to target. Um, so, for example, around the Achilles, you might see that there's some, um, you know, fluid around the um, the sheath, or there might be some other problems around the tendon that uh, you can potentially then look at and say, uh, you know, that's uh, a useful indication for imaging. Okay. While we're on that topic, um, you did mention like the tendon sheath, but are there any other structures like within the tendon or surrounding the tendon structure that could mimic a tendinopathy, like have the same type of symptoms? Yeah, look, there, there, there are. There's, um, so tendons usually have a fat pad around them. Um, uh, so, for example, the big fatty tissue around the, the, the tower tendon, uh, there's often a bursa. Um, there's often other tendons like uh, the, uh, you know, the tibialis posterior tendon around the ankle um, or the plantaris tendon around the Achilles. Uh, so so you, you do get these tissues that can give you some symptoms around that same area. Uh, but I guess what um, people are moving towards is more um, an appreciation that the tendon pain often involves multiple tissues. So if you look at, say, an insertional Achilles problem, um, you often see, if you look at an MRI or an ultrasound, you see changes around the tendon. You see some changes in the in the bursa. You also see some changes in the bone. So it's what 
what people call the emphasis organ. It's it's all all those tissues are so close together, and once you have pathology, it tends to it tends to be across all those tissues. So, and and we have no way of knowing which one's causing the pain. Um, so, in a, in a way, you treat them in a very similar way when it comes to exercise and loading. There may be some slight differences in terms of um, um, you know other things you might do. So, if you've got um, an inflammatory tissue component like a paracetamol, then you might do some you know anti-inflammatory things like uh, some topical anti-inflammatory, but um, for all intents and purposes, a lot of the rehab is based on just good progressive exercise based on their tolerance and based on what positions they can tolerate and what type of loading and intensity of loading they can tolerate. So, um, you know, and that and that's regardless of some of those diagnoses um, around the area. But yeah, there, there are lots of, you know, differential diagnoses. There's probably a list of 10 or 15 for each of the tendons um, that, we're, that, that you sort of uh, commonly see. Okay. And like I said, you might recommend scans for someone who is going through a really good rehab, really good program, but not responding the way we're expecting is um, it could be something like a paratenon or a sheath or a bursa or other structures that might be impacted. And maybe if we identify those and it fits kind of the relationship of what they're presenting with, we can more, we can come up with more effective management plan and maybe, do some anti inflams for a little bit um, just to, if there is an inflammatory component to settle things down. But the overarching message is strengthening and progressing through your loads in order to tolerate more and more. Have I got that? Have I got yeah, that? Right? That's, that's pretty much true. But what, what I would say is that um, from day one, the initial assessment, you should have a pretty good idea of, um, you should have a pretty good idea of what diagnosis. So day one, you'll get an you'll, you'll get an inkling from your clinical assessment that maybe there is a, a plantaris or a paracetamol component or, or or something else here. And then um, you know you may uh, you, you may get that idea from early on. Um, in which case, um, in which case, then you can. Um, uh, you can treat them for that. You can treat them as if you, you know, clinically that's your diagnosis. You treat them for that. You can, um, uh, if you're not sure, uh, look at some imaging earlier on to say, okay, uh, I want to confirm this clinical suspicion I have that they may have a plantar or something else, but only do that if it's going to change your management. So if you are going to get, say, an injection or do the anti-inflammatory treatments or do something different that you think is going to help them. But if you're not, then there's no need to. So um, so wait the 12 weeks and if they're not getting better, then look at imaging at that point. Brilliant. I think it's also important to mention if we're talking about scans and the findings that might come back um, to it, not just for tendons, but for any injury, there might be some degeneration here and there. And the scans, if it's like an MRI and they're scanning a whole bunch of structures, it will come back with a lot of findings that might be incidental and might not be contributing to your symptoms. Um, it's it, absolutely, it'd that's be very a, nice really if you know thing. someone got scans and they weren't allowed to look at it until someone who's very proficient in identifying and knows your symptoms and knows your presentation can interpret the way they want to communicate to the client. But it's not necessarily the case. It's usually straight to a GP who reads it out and comes up with the findings and ingrains a lot of maybe um, anxiety or fear with a lot of people. Yeah, I absolutely agree. One of the areas that I'm really interested in researching at the moment is um, we're looking at how uh, reports of how shoulder rotator cuff related pain is reported, how that affects the patient. So ah, very good. Yeah, someone said, look, I've, you've got this tear, full, you know how they have all these descriptions like full thickness, um, you know, they have all these, all these descriptive terms that sound so serious. Um, how, how does that affect the patient? And uh, so we're doing some, one of my uh, students is doing some qualitative work interviews. So we're accessing scans from a radiology place and then we're going to, um, you know, the, the ones that... Um, have got these features interview people and say what you know how did that affect you and what did, it cha did you change your behavior because of it mm. yeah right makes you think doesn't it i um mm. i have a 
a question written down here that says, oh, what's the best management for a tendinopathy that's like, say, two weeks old compared to six months compared to, say, two plus years? Um, I'm not too sure if your answer is just going to be loading and progress from there. Would you have anything that you wanted to add based on um, the, the correct re- response to management at those time frames? Um, the only thing I'd say is that it's um, uh, the management's always based on uh, the presentation at that time, and that could be things like um, primarily their pain and function. Um, so if they're really, really weak or they've got really poor power or they're really fear avoidant, um, then you'll target those aspects. If, they're, if they've got really high levels of pain, so you do some... Um, you know, some loading or exercise with them and they're reporting really high pain or they report high pain day to day when they're, when they're doing things, um, then, you, then you would probably use a different approach. And uh, generally there's two phases of the rehab. One is manage their symptoms, get it down to a tolerable minimal level. And the second phase is then progressively re-engage with all the activities that they may have had to stop because of their pain being so high. And so... If regardless if they've had it for two weeks or um, 10 years, the approach would be the same based on those factors. Okay. And if we're thinking about the um, continuum model of pathology and a tendon is a bit more advanced and they're in that degeneration phase and there might be some unhealthy parts of the tendon, does that change management at all? Um. Not really. So the actual pathology on the scan doesn't change our management. So if we're confident it's a tendon, then we try and load to bring about, you know, tolerance and and better ability to load that tendon. You know, you could say better capacity, but um, whether it's a degenerate tendon or one that looks a bit worse on a scan or, you know, as the continuum model would say, reactive, we don't really... We can't because we don't have any evidence that we should be doing one thing for one and different thing for the other. So it's all it's it still is based on pain and function. Yeah, that, I think that's a um, it's reassuring for people to know because for someone really undergoing a lot of say pain and like their symptoms are quite high and they're lost a lot of their uh, like you say reengagement with maybe running or something with the community or even just day to day up downstairs, that sort of thing. The management is still quite the same. If they are, if you're seeing a client and they do have years of say chronic um, patella tendon and they are really anxious and you can tell that the brain like rewiring might have a lot to do with it. And they're really, um, yeah, they've just, um, what's the word? They're, they're just really scared about movement. Is there a way you can use your communication or that communication framework that you talked about before in order to um, educate them what's happening with the tendon and yeah, sort of restill a lot of that reassurance? Yep. I think that's really critical part of the, of the role that we can play. Um, so uh, I've got uh, yeah, in this education type um, resource that we've developed, we have um, lots of things that we target in there and some of them are focused towards, um, you know, not aggravating it and trying to, you know, reduce activities in the short term that might be aggravating it. And um, it, there's things about um, the pathology itself and the risk factors. Uh, but then there's also lots about pain and understanding that pain is not equal to pathology or damage. Um, that you know you can have a little bit of pain when you're doing activity, but as long as it's not flaring up and that that sort of thing to reassure people. That you know, and also talking about the pathology and that you know even if there is a tear there, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to get worse. And you don't you know when there's pain, you're not making the tear worse. So all those things can help fear avoidant type uh, behaviours. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very important part of um, um, education for these people. And as you say, everyone's slightly different. So for some people, that's going to be a really important component for other people. Um, you know, they're, they're not worried at all. They're, in fact, they just they have the opposite response. Some people are just 
um, are probably doing too much. So um, it will be very individual. There's two good points I want to reiterate there. And I did a, a, a little mini series on the pain science um, earlier in the podcast. So um, people might be familiar with this, but just getting that point across that pain doesn't always equal pathology. If you do have low amounts of pain or if you have really high amounts of pain, there's no correlation between um, the actual structure damage or anything that's going on there, but also it is okay um, under the right guidance to load the tendon, even if it is sore. And I think you might agree that there's ways to overload it and overdo it if there's pain, but there's also a really sensible dosage under pain, which can be really easily managed, but actually help the recovery of the tendon. Would you yeah. agree with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely agree. <clears throat> absolutely agree. So it's, uh, it's finding that balance, as you say, def- definitely. Okay. Um, I wanted to finish up with a few Facebook group questions um, and we'll see how we go for time and see if we can get through all of them. But I want to start with Julia asks, how many times a week do you recommend for strengthening once there's, I think she was saying she's recovered from her tendinopathy, but she just really doesn't want it to reoccur or um, pain to increase. So how many times a week would you recommend a strengthening program to keep everything at bay? Yeah, that, that's that's a really good question. Um, you, we don't really have a, a, a good answer that's based on evidence for that, but um, some patients seem to better get away with nothing, so they stop completely and they're fine. Um, other patients, I, I generally advise do something at least once a week to so maintain. If you don't, you know, if it's not in your nature or your routine to be doing stuff like going to the gym or doing exercise at home, you don't. You know, or you don't go to an exercise classes. You can sort of incorporate um, things there more easily if you do two or three times a week. Um, but for people who want to do the bare minimum, uh, I think once a week is fine. It's just about maintaining your strength. Once you're once you're back to your activities, generally people don't have you know that many problems. Okay, I think that that's a good point that you made. It's about maintaining the strength because if we're looking at kind of a load based model and making sure we're not um, excessively exceeding that load, someone might do strengthening once a week and still maintain the strength that's required for their weekly um, dosage or the, the weekly kind of power and strength that they're going through. But someone might be also being quite intense in the gym or increasing for a marathon or something and might need strengthening more than once, maybe two to three times a week, but it all just depend on the circumstances and how much uh, strength or load you're willing to put through that tendon and just keeping the strength slightly above those requirements, um, I think is a really good point. But you also quickly mentioned, um, and I think I'll just add on to that. There's a certain type of people that just develop tendinopathies. I don't know if it's... Um, a DNA type of thing or genetics or something, but you do have a certain type of person that just not only just within one tendon, but just will get bilateral tendinopathies or they've just overcome a patellar tendinopathy. Now it's Achilles on the other side and um, they just yep. seem to get them. And I think if you're that type of person, then strengthening might be a little bit more higher on the priority list. Would you agree with that? Yeah, look, there's, there, there, there's, uh, tendinopathy is multifactorial in its um, in its sort of risk factor profile. So there are people that, you know, on the young end of the spectrum who are just dominated by load uh, and they're just doing a lot of jumping and running. Um, and then there are people on the older end of the spectrum who've got all these other comorbidities like they could have metabolic uh, problems or they might have uh, be going through estrogen and ha- uh, est- be going through menopause and have a, a, a loss of estrogen. Um, there might be people who, you know, age is a risk factor, um, obesity. There are so many risk factors that are not related to load. Um, but as you say, there's also genetic type factors. So you can have someone who's young and they have had three or four different types of tendon pain, you know, in, the, in, the, in sort of five years or something. And you start to think they've probably got a predisposition there. Um, and there's not much you can do about that unfortunately but you just you know you know they're going to be difficult to manage 
Um, some people are more difficult than others. Certainly, there are you know tendon patients that don't respond well and uh, take a long time to to get better. I mean, I, I've seen sometimes I see tendon patients for over a year, um, and they just slowly trickle away and get better over time. But and that's part of our job in terms of motivating people because it's not easy to be sticking to your rehab and um, you know be motivated for a year, and uh, that's sometimes what it takes. Yeah, laying down those expectations. Um, we'll move on. Uh, so thanks, Julia, for asking that. Lance has Achilles tendinopathy and was wondering if uh, treatment needs to be changed if symptoms arise from the insertion point or mid-portion. Is there any change in management that can be more effective? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of key things. One is you don't want to be doing exercise over a step right into dorsiflexion. So hanging the heel right over a step if you've got an insertional problem because that can aggravate it. Um, the second thing is you probably want to be very careful with the type of shoes you're wearing and um, uh, thinking about higher heeled, well, not uh, some sort of pitch on the shoes so you can try and take stress off the insertion. But having said that, it also works for mid-portion Achilles very well, having higher highest heeled shoes um, because it takes pressure off. And that's the idea with the heel wedge. The heel wedge is designed to take some pressure off. I was part of a group that did a trial out of La Trobe Uni that has just um, just about to be accepted, hopefully. And, and the comparison there was eccentric training, which is a popular type of exercise for Achilles tendinopathy, and then compared to just the heel wedge, nothing else. And what we found in that trial is that there, there wasn't much difference between the groups, but there was there were some outcomes that were actually favouring the heel wedge. Um, so I use heel wedges um, a lot probably started to use them a lot more after the, those findings. Um, uh, and a quite chunky 1.2 centimeter heel wedges. Aside from that, the treatments are quite similar. There's, there's, there's talk about, you know, differences in outcome. So, so you know, uh, people think, oh, the insertional ones are harder, but I don't know about that. The evidence isn't very strong uh, one way or the other. They both can be quite difficult. Um, they both can be difficult. Um, you know, the, the principles are, are pretty similar for both of them. You know, shockwave therapy is an option, um, some of the injections. So so overall, aside from the exercise loading, it's pretty similar. I need to ask the question because uh, some others might be thinking the same thing. When you're talking about these heel wedges, if you have tendon pain on just the right side, do you need to put the heel wedges in both shoes? Yes, yeah, it's, it's always good to have them in both shoes because um, you just want to even, you know, be even even as, as possible and not um, uh, put any unexpected loads, other loads through your body. Um, but generally, yeah, the ones I use are 1.2 centimetres high. So they're, they're pretty, they're reasonably high heel wedges. So you want to use two. Yeah, perfect. Um, Linda asked, uh, at what point should we get a scan? But I think we answered that already. I think it was more around if we're not responding to uh, a really good rehab plan, um, perhaps we could get scans. If it, if the diagnosis is different, if it would change our management, that's when we should get scans. Is there anything you want exactly. to add to that? That's, 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 that's perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what I would uh, say. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so we've got Donna and Amanda who kind of asked the same question or were intrigued about the same question. Um, is there a point where full recovery is not likely and treatment is directed more towards symptom management rather than like a full recovery? Sorry, say that again. It's so kind of like, um, do I have to, if I've got a really bad chronic tendon for years and years, does it get to a certain point where I just have to live with it and have to put up with it or is yes. there hope for them? Yeah. Um, they look, I, I routinely see people with 10 year history of, you know, problems and they feel like that's never going to get better. So, but it does. And I have had some that have good recovery, others that don't have so good recovery. So it's hard to predict, but uh, I think, it is possible if you do all the right things for long enough to get rid of pain completely. I do believe that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, and just rolling through these, Liz asked, um, 
how to handle a dual problem of having both chronic perineal and posterior tendinopathy. So like the same foot, different sides of the ankle. Um, if you're trying to manage both tendons, is there any change in management that we need to do? Uh, what were the tendons? Perineal and... Uh, I think she's put perineal and posterior tendinopathy. So maybe like tip post. Tip post, yeah. Uh, yeah, so both sides of the ankle. Uh, look, they are very different problems with very different types of sort of, you know, rehabs that you would do for them. Um, I guess with all the management, you would start with what are the drivers for this? Why is this person getting this? Is it, like we said, some metabolic stuff or just age um, combined with, say, menopause or something else? Or uh, is there some biomechanical things we can change like footwear or, um, you know, uh, the strength and flexibility around the leg? Um, so I think starting with that is probably, um, but yeah, it, it, it's always going to come down to uh, those factors. But, uh, you know, you would then uh, start to try and bring about tolerance to both of those tendons. And, you know, the, 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 the overall um, principles are the same, but yeah, there'll be different approaches for both of them. Okay. I was just writing that down. Um, and so Trent, uh, put in a message here and he got in in just the nick of time um, so he's asking there's a lot of stuff coming out more recently around strengthening foot intrinsics and um, he was interested to hear your thoughts on um, relating this to Achilles tendinopathy and do you feel like it's important to combine foot intrinsics with Achilles tendinopathy management and um, if you implement that yourself yeah look that, that's a good question I, I don't think it I don't think it hurts, but I don't think it's absolutely indispensable. Um, I think for a lot of people, they get lots of good proprioceptive, um, you know, um, uh, input from something like doing intrinsics. Um, and for some people, it may benefit them. Um, and, but I don't think it's absolutely indispensable. I do use it for some people. Uh, if I think that the foot is, uh, there's a component of the foot for a lot of tibials, posterior patients, but I don't think it's I don't think it's indispensable. The thing the thing that I sort of point to is that if you're doing heavy heavy loading, you'll get some strength through the foot. You have to because the foot's a lever and it's loads going through it. But you may not get the proprioceptive input, and that's where I do things like um, heel to toe walks and various foot drills, and they sort of they would, I would argue, give you some proprioceptive input anyway. So I don't, I don't go a lot to just the pure sort of foot, um, you know, uh, intrinsic type basic exercises. Uh, just, yeah, that's just sort of a personal thing, I guess. Okay. And would that be someone who's you've identified as lacking proprioception in your testing? Well, anyone who's got a foot, uh, component to it. So say they've got some um, pronation when they're walking or they've got, um, um, uh, say, um, yeah, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't really look at the proprioception so much, but more, more the pronation uh, biomechanical foot component, then I would um, probably look at um, their foot intrinsics as well as, say, if they're weak around inversion, tib post, um, type people, then I would add in the foot, uh, some sort of foot strength as well. Okay. Very nice. Um, we're going to finish, well, we're finished with the Facebook group questions. So thanks to everyone who submitted those. As we finish up here, are there any like key takeaway messages for anyone with a chronic tendinopathy that a message maybe we haven't got across today um, that's really important or do you think we've pretty much covered everything? Yeah. I would probably say the message I give to uh, most patients is be patient and just do the really simple things really well for a long time and most people get better. Don't stress too much about it. Uh, do, the simple, do the simple things uh, really well. Persevere with them. Don't jump to, like, you know, your quick fixes um, unless, you know, don't jump to your quick fix unless you've done the, uh, done the rehab and everything else really well. Uh, so I think it's I think I think it's about patient and mindset, uh, patience and mindset. Very good. And I think having the right health professional that lays down those expectations as well is pretty key, so that the message gets across and the right education's there. Um, yep. Brilliant. I think we covered a lot of ground here. Um, 
Peter, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, you're doing really fantastic things in the world around tendinopathies, uh, particularly for this running population. And it can be very, very chronic. It can be very, very debilitating for a lot of people. I know on like social media and on Facebook and stuff, people just post, I've had, you know, years and years of certain tendinopathies. This is what I can't do now. And it's, it can be such a debilitating uh, condition if you let it. And thanks for putting out your research and sharing your knowledge because the more knowledge we have, the more effective we can be with our treatment and management. So, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for disseminating. I think it's a very important job to also get the message across to patients and clinicians. So uh, thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Peter's such a great guy. Um, I was blessed to have him on. And yeah, I was stoked when he said that uh, he would agree to take part in, in an interview. And then the value he was delivering was just immense. Um, I know we kind of brushed over Shockwave a little bit, but I do have some Shockwave episodes that I will be delivering in the near future, um, straight from the Run Smarter podcast. But yeah, there's like an hour and 15 minutes of Shockwave content. So we will dive into all things Shockwave. Um, just need to be, be a bit patient and it will come out soon. Um, some key takeaways for the proximal hamstring tendinopathy world. Let's um, start with the scans. So you don't need to get scans for a diagnosis. There's enough clinical tests as long as you find the right health professional that is able to accurately diagnose you. Um, it is We just do clinical tests to diagnose that. And it reduces the risk of you getting scans and it coming back showing a whole bunch of degeneration or tendinosis and that just sparks a lot of fear and anxiety when it comes to wanting to load the tendon or sit. And like Peter Maliara said, there's degeneration is completely normal. And if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond, and it does show mild forms of degeneration, um, it can sometimes be communicated a bit differently and can spark a lot of anxiety for people. So be careful when getting scans. If there is um, the correct diagnosis, then it's not needed. However, if there is a potential for a differential diagnosis or the potential that you're just not responding to a well-designed program, maybe it's worth getting scans to see if there's anything else it could be. But don't get too caught up in the findings if they do find some tendon degeneration. Strength is repeated several times throughout that interview and making sure that the strength is progressive. And one of the key takeaways, which I found really nice, is it doesn't matter how far in your rehab, how long you've had this tendon pain for, strength and rehab and progressive strength is still the number one method for rehab. And so you could have it for two weeks, you could have it for two years, you could have it for 20 years. The rehab is still the same. The methods are still the same. However, how heavy you go, what the dosages are, just depends in that moment how sensitive, what the pain levels are like and what your function is like. So we just assess in the moment pain and function and then based on that, we um, use clinical justification or just find a starting point and then work your way up from there. A tendon may be very strong but could be painful so that's where we're looking at the function side of things and the pain side of things. However, a tendon could be really, really weak and just not showing a lot of signs of pain. Um, so we always got to weigh up the two, and they're not necessarily they don't necessarily correlate. I know I've talked about this a fair few times on the on previous episodes, but just because a tendon is sore doesn't mean that it's weak. We need to put it through some level of strengthening to see how it will tolerate and um, build up from there. So that was another key takeaway. And then Peter Maliaris just summed up really, really well at the end that is worth repeating. Do the simple things really well and be patient. And a lot of people get caught up with trying different things, trying you know five different options after something doesn't work for two weeks and then just moving on to the next thing and moving on to the next thing. Whereas if you've had a tendinopathy for several months or beyond, you really want to be patient. You really want to give things a go. Um, stick to a regimented plan and be patient. See how it feels over 
several weeks. And if it's very gradually getting better, then continue with that. Continue with that process. Um, Like I said, you need to do the simple things really, really well and just be patient. Patience and mindset is a key takeaway that um, that Peter Maliaris highlighted at the very end. So there we have it. The podcast is growing. It's kicking off. I highly recommend if you know someone with proximal hamstring tendinopathy to please share this podcast out. Um, It's one of the only ways that the podcast can grow if we can start getting it to more people. Um, So if you're finding benefit with your own rehab and you're finding it very useful, please, please share it out. That's all for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed. And for now, take care of yourselves.